Hello, Oscon. What a privilege to be giving a keynote at this conference in particular. I really do feel at home with all of you here. One person who's really made me feel at home is the individual who does put this conference on every single year with great success. Let's give it up for the Oscon show one more time. Rachel Romeliotis. Nice work, Rachel. <clears throat> so, as Rachel said, I'm Alvin Salehi. I've had the privilege of working at the White House for a little while now, since 2015, to be exact. And since then, we've actually been fortunate enough to make some significant strides in the world of government tech. One of the things that we've been working on with great, great efforts is trying to figure out ways to unlock the potential of open source software across the entire federal government. Now, I'm not exactly sure how everybody here feels about open source. I think I can guess. But just to be sure, I'm going to put up a quote from a recent Wired article from a few months back. And you can let me know whether you agree with this or not. <clears throat> the quote says, open source is among the most important ideas in the history of technology. What do you think about that? I thought that's how you might react. All right, so now that we know we're all on the same page, this article goes on to say this. The source code policy is the latest in a long line of high-profile victories for the open source movement. Now, as many of you are aware, back in August of last year, 2016, after years of bureaucratic hurdling, after months of direct engagement with the tech community, and after thousands of public comments directly from you on GitHub and other public channels, we were able to finally release the country's first ever federal policy that actually advocates for open source software. <laughs> Pretty big deal. One of the reasons this is important is because many of you are aware that the federal government spends a lot of money on software transactions every year. We're talking to the tune of billions of dollars on thousands of transactions. And unfortunately, many of these transactions up until recently have been duplicative, meaning that the government is actually unknowingly spending money for software that is already developed. Needless to say, that's highly inefficient, and quite frankly, it's unacceptable. And we decided we had to put an end to it to ensure that we're spending your hard-earned taxpayer dollars responsibly and efficiently. So that was a significant achievement of the policy, but that wasn't the only thing we achieved. No, we were just getting warmed up. The next thing that we achieved was this. The federal source code policy specifically requires two things. One, government-wide reuse. What does that mean? From this point forward, all contracts for custom-developed software must require that that code be allowed to be shared and reused across the entire federal government to ensure that we are reducing those duplicative acquisitions. The other thing and I think you guys will be more excited about this one, is this. We launched an unprecedented pilot program that requires that at least, at least 20% of all custom-developed government code must be released to the public as open source software. <laughs> so, the interesting thing about this is, it's actually quite significant. Because, as many of us know, effectuating positive change across the federal government is really difficult. And it's especially difficult when you're trying to release code. But the use case was clear. As long as we carved out exemptions for national security, privacy, and other sensitive information, releasing open source code presented the federal government with a unique opportunity to actually leverage the brilliant brain power of technologists all around the country to review and improve our nation's software. And now, it's, more than, it's easier, the easiest it's ever been for anybody, anytime, any place, to give back to the country through code. And you might be wondering, all right, Alvin, what's the easiest way for me to give back? What's the easiest way for me to submit a pull request on a government repo? Well, enter code.gov. Code.gov is now the nation's primary destination for sharing and improving government software. I've had a lot of people come up to me recently, especially over the last few months, to ask me 
Alvin, what is in store for code.gov? What does the future of the platform look like? And it's a completely valid question, particularly because we have new leadership in the White House. Thankfully, the new administration is also supportive of this initiative. Why? Because the facts are clear. As we've said, the federal source code policy, and now code.gov, have the potential to save the federal government, and by proxy, the American taxpayers, millions of dollars by cutting excessive spending due to duplicative acquisitions. And quite frankly, folks, I'm happy to share that saving money is something that the federal government invariably supports. And it's something that the government will always support and should always support, regardless of whether you are red or blue. I happen to be wearing both, by the way, just so you know. Okay. All jokes aside, though, this is a completely nonpartisan issue, as it should be, and it's something we can all get behind. So with that, I'm excited to declare right here on this stage, right now, that code.gov is here to stay. Since we launched Code.gov back in November, we've already made significant progress. Nearly 90% of all agencies covered in the federal source code policy are already represented on Code.gov. Here's a quick snapshot of several of the agencies that you'll find on Code.gov currently. And I'm scanning across the room, I see a lot of people smiling, and I suspect the smiles are due to the fact that a lot of these agencies are agencies that you never would have expected would actually release their code as open source software. And frankly, I love to see that reaction because that is the epitome of culture change, and we're achieving it at the federal level. On that note, I always get asked one question about one particular agency, because people are very dubious that this agency would ever release code. And I'm sure you can guess it. The agency is this, the Department of Defense. And you know, this is the best part about this whole story. Even the Department of Defense is releasing code as open source software. The Pentagon is releasing projects as open source software. It's incredible. If you had told me that a few years ago, I wouldn't have believed it. And that is a great sign that what we're doing is actually making a difference, and we're actually trying to achieve our objectives here. Now, one of the projects that they just recently released is, for lack of a better word, completely badass. Sorry, but there's actually no other way to describe it, and I'll tell you why. This software is currently being used in Afghanistan as part of a NATO mission to help advise Afghan officials in rebuilding their country. Incredible. It's amazing. It blows my mind every time I hear about it. And today, I'm going to lift the curtain on the story behind that incredible code. Okay? So... Let's step back and give you some context quickly. As we all know, there are several missions that take place around the world all the time. One of the missions that we're currently involved in is called Operation Resolute Support. It's a train, advise, assist mission led by NATO in Afghanistan that involves approximately 13,000 troops. One of the issues that they were experiencing recently was a pretty simple issue if you think about it. These NATO advisors usually rotate in and out every single year, okay? And as a result, it becomes ex increasingly difficult to track which advisors have trained which officials. So when a new advisor comes in, typically there is some duplicative training that takes place as the old advisor rotates out. Duplicative training, as we know, leads to inefficiency, and inefficiency leads to excessive spending. Are you starting to sense a theme here? Duplicative work is no stranger to the federal government, but it's something that we are committed to working on resolving and addressing every single day. So how did we address this particular issue in Afghanistan? Well, enter the Defense Digital Service. These folks are part of the U.S. Digital Service, which is essentially the tech SWAT team of the federal government. They're incredible. One person in particular that I want to point out is the young lady on the left. She was the manager on this project. Her name is Erin Delaney. Erin had a cushy job in the private sector in Silicon Valley. And she decided, you know what? I want to go join the government to give back to the country through tech. So that's exactly what she did. She came to D.C., and I kid you not, one month, just one month into her job, she found herself in a Black Hawk helicopter 
on her way to Kabul to help NATO troops solve their most pressing tech problems. Amazing. So let's fast forward a few months. And it turns out that the NATO troops were using a piece of software that was essentially a clunky piece of CRM software that took hours and hours to actually learn how to use. And so as a result, not many people were using it the right way. So after a couple of discovery sprints in Afghanistan, the DDS team, the Defense Digital Service, decided, you know what, we got to rebuild this from scratch, this time with the users rather than for the users, right? User-centered design, very important principle in building a successful product. What did they call the project? The project was called ANET, short for the Advisor Network. And if you think about it, DDS was in a bit of a time crunch because every day that NATO advisors didn't have a successful and useful piece of software to use was another day that they were not able to track their engagement successfully. So if only there were some sort of platform to help build, you, build your software efficiently, especially when part of your team is in Kabul and the other part is in Washington, D.C. I think you can see where this is going. What these guys decided to do was actually use GitHub to help build their software, which in and of itself is pretty progressive for the Pentagon, if you think about it. On top of that, it actually worked. They ended up building a beta version of ANET in just 14 weeks. And then they made one of their boldest decisions yet. The DDS team made this call. Let's release ANET as open source software. Oh, when I think about it, I still get chills. <laughs> so you might be thinking this. Wait a second, Alvin. Assuming that all the information exchanged as part of these NATO missions is classified and confidential, wouldn't open sourcing the project present some sort of risk to national security? So a lot of people shaking their heads. The answer is no. As we all know, open sourcing something doesn't mean releasing classified coordinates. It doesn't mean releasing personally identifiable information. In fact, that information is completely separate, as it should be. It shouldn't be part of your code to begin with. That's just bad practice, regardless of whether you're open sourcing something or not. So what these folks did was they took the project itself, went to Afghanistan, and installed it on a classified secret server in Afghanistan, not available to any member of the public. And then separately, they took the self-contained project and released it as open source software. And this is pretty useful software, if you think about it. At its core, ANET is just an intuitive tracking platform. So in the government context, that can be used in a lot of different ways. The State Department and USAID they can use it to track their engagements abroad in their missions. NGOs can use it to help facilitate their work in developing countries. Frankly, you can use it to track your, what you ate for breakfast. It really doesn't matter. The fact is, it's yours. You paid for it. We, the federal government, built it. And now it's yours to use. End of story. And with that, I'm excited to officially announce that ANET is now on code.gov. So, incredible story. As we bring this amazing journey we've shared to a close, I want you to think about something. This is a different side of open source we don't always get to see. We've talked about the cost savings aspect, which is very significant. We've talked about transparency with open source, also very important. But this is a side of open source that offers the potential of technology to help bolster the safety of Americans abroad and the ability of open source software, the software itself, to potentially help our troops and our advisors around the world in fulfilling their objectives. And I'm certain that more stories like this will emerge as code.gov continues to grow as a national platform. So I'd like to end on a quote that I think sums up our efforts pretty nicely. It's from Robert Frost. He wrote this almost 100 years ago. It says, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. 
We've come a long way in the world of open source as a community, but we're not quite out of the woods yet, right? I promised you culture change, and we're delivering on that promise, as you can see. But we still have miles and miles to go before we reach the end of this journey. And we can't reach the end without your help and your support. So what do you say? Here's to getting out of the woods together and working with one another to unlock the true value of open source software for the entire country. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>